Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning for some. We are now starting our webinar and uh, we welcome you to the second Genome Editing 101 webinar organized by the International Service for the Acquisition of Agri Biotech Applications or ISA. I am Rodora Romero Aldenida, Director of ISA Southeast Asia Center and Director of the Global Knowledge Center on Crop Biotechnology your host and moderator of this webinar, hosted by ISA Southeast Asia Center. ISA is a nonprofit charitable organization that has a new mission to promote transparency and knowledge sharing on agricultural biosciences, enhancing trust in the food system, allowing safe and effective innovations to contribute to a sustainable future. ISA holds these webinars to share the potentials and benefits of genome editing to the one health concept of healthy crops, animals, and the environment, we want to take advantage of the importance of early engagements among experts, regulators, and the public, and wants to highlight progress on new innovations as part of our knowledge sharing mandate. AISA is committed to ensure modern biotechnology and new breeding innovations are communicated and adopted in a transparent manner where trust is a key element for the benefits of the stakeholders. The first webinar was hosted by the AISA APRI Center, headed by Director Margaret Karembu. Please wave your hand with focus, which was focused on the science of genome editing, applications in food and agriculture, and in healthcare. Tonight's discussion will start with a recap by Dr. Martin Lema, raise your hand, from Argentina on the science and applications in agriculture for those who are not able to join the first seminar and the regulatory perspective. This is followed by applications to healthcare by Dr. Nina Gloriani from the Philippines. <laughs> And then followed by applications, uh, and then applications in industry by Dr. Marcus Weiss from Switzerland. We also have with us our global coordinator, Dr. Maha Arujanan. Hello, and, everyone. Yeah. And so our webinar will run for one and a half hours. We will have live five poll questions distributed within the course of the webinar. Our audience can send their questions or comments via the Q&A button down there at the bottom, which will be answered by our panelists during the Q&A portion. So uh, with that, I would like to invite uh, the participants to see the first question, please. The first poll question, EJ. So here is the first poll question. Gene editing can and will replace genetic modification completely. Okay, yes. So a lot of people believe that it's not gonna replace genetic modification. Thank you very much. Now I'll start to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Martin Lema was the former director of biotechnology at the National University Ministry of Agriculture in Argentina and the Executive Secretary of the National Advisory Commission on Agriculture Biotechnology mm -hmm. or CONABIA when it was recognized as an FAO reference center on biosafety of genetically modified organisms. He pioneered the development and application of criteria for the regulation of genome edited organisms for agricultural use recognized worldwide. He has extensive experience in government scientific advisory, science diplomacy, and policy making in biotechnology, and worked in various areas of the executive branch of the Argentinian government for 15 years. He is internationally recognized in the field of agro-industrial biotechnology regulation and had extensive collaborations with the United Nations institutions, 
regional organizations, and with several governments in the creation and improvement of national and international regulatory frameworks. He is currently an adjunct professor at the National University of Quilmes, Argentina, and the director of technology transfer at the university at the same university. Uh, Dr. Lema, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone. We, we will begin by, uh, by going through a short recap of the uh, previous seminar um, about uh, the application of genome editing to agriculture. So in, in our previous se seminar, uh, Professor Steven Runo um, began by explaining what is uh, genome editing. I'm going to make a very short recap. Uh, genome editing is a technique that has been around for about two decades now. Scientists have been uh, using these techniques for about two decades. And it's a molecular biology technique that allows making changes in the genome of an organism. And it is usually compared to the generation of genetically modified organisms because both of them are biotechnology techniques. In the generation of, bi uh, of genetically modified organisms, you usually have the insertion of a foreign gene uh, into the genome. And when it comes to genome editing, it is usually described as a technique that uh, just uh, introduces a small change uh, or generates a small change in the genome without introducing a foreign DNA. Actually, I think uh, this technique uh, shall be considered as a continuum or shall be compared against uh, different ways of improving plants and animals. Uh, here you have uh, um, at least four of them. Uh, you have conventional breeding. In, in conventional breeding, you cross to plants or to animals, uh, usually from the same species, but in, in plants, sometimes you can also cross a species that is edible with a related uh, species that is uh, non-edible or, or wild uh, in order to obtain a, a plant with genes combined from the two parent organisms. And then you have a mutation. Mutation breeding can be made in different ways. In this um, slide, it is shown how it can be made by using chemicals or uh, radio radiological substances. So in mutation breeding, there is a small damage to the DNA and the cell uh, repairs itself that damage, but the repair that is not perfect. And therefore, a change is generated in the, in the genome. Then you have transgenesis. Uh, as I described, uh, it, it implies introduction of a gene of a foreign gene into an organism. And now you have genome editing, which in the simpler case is very similar to mutation breeding. Uh, a, a small uh, damage is created in the DNA. The DNA repairs by itself, or the cell repairs uh, the DNA without any help. And uh, if that repair most of the time goes well, uh, but sometimes it can generate a small or different uh, change in the genome sequence of that organism, and that's a mutation. And that mutation sometimes can be good for agriculture and production of food. So it's very similar to mutation breeding in the result. Uh, the technique only differs uh, that in mutation breeding, you use a chemical or a radiological substance that damages the DNA uh, anywhere randomly. And in genome editing, you use a molecular biology technique that goes straight to the place where you want to introduce a change. Here uh, we have a three, we are going to see three examples of applications in agriculture. Uh, now you are seeing one of the cases that are most famous or more known worldwide, um, rapeseed or canola plant a variety that has been modified so it can tolerate a herbicide that has been achieved using a particular genome editing technique called oligonucleotide directed mutagenesis. And the change was just uh, modifying a single amino acid in the sequence of a protein, uh, which is the target of the herbicide. So now the plant is uh, not sensible to the herbicide. The interesting thing is that this mutation already existed in some other rapeseed varieties. It was not so easy to replicate it in, uh, in different varieties. So in order to have this exactly the same mutation, uh, the genome editing technique was used. 
that the mutation itself already existed in nature. Uh, it was uh, an intraday the varieties. Now we have we turn to an example in animals. This is a genetically edited uh, fish, uh, a tilapia. The modification uh, was made with a different uh, genome editing technique called site direct or the that involves the use of a site directed nuclease, an enzyme that uh, uh, makes a um, goes to the DNA finds the exact place where it must uh, introduce a change and it uh, makes it, it work. In here, the modification leads to the animal having uh, or producing more meat. So it, it increases productivity and, and, some, and, and directly sustainability of the production. And this mutation uh, was not new again. It was already present in some terrestrial animals. And in here, uh, we have a, an example in microorganisms. This is a bacteria that uh, naturally it fixes nitrogen from the air and converts it to a different chemical form that the plant can use. So it acts like a biofertilizer. The, 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 this uh, microorganism was doing this uh, before the, the application of, of a genome editing technique. In this case, the, the technique is called homologous recombination. And in this case, the, the, the intervention was to modify a gene of the bacteria that um, consumes nitrogen. So now the nitrogen that the bacteria was originally fixing, there is a higher quantity available for the plant. So it's a more efficient uh, way of biological nitrogen fixation or um, fertilization. And therefore, this, um, this uh, application also leads to a higher productivity, but also higher sustainability of agricultural production. But those are only three examples. Here you can see statistics. Uh, these statistics only reflect things that are being presented to the Argentine regulatory system. You can see that there is a, a diversity in different traits, and many of those traits are related with the consumer improving products for consumer preference or improving products for consuming for uh, consumers health uh, as well as products that were uh, are being developed to make uh, an plants and animal of, of agricultural use uh, either more productive or better suited to a more sustainable production and also these modifications are being um, introduced in many different kinds of uh, organisms of agricultural use. So now turning to the regulation of this, first of all, I would like to compare for you the two uh, pathways or regulatory pathways that have been established along uh, the past decades. The older one on your left is the regulation for new varieties or, or new breeds in, in animals or in vegetables or in plants, sorry. So in, in the case of new varieties of breeds, these, these varieties or, or new animal breeds are new because they were obtained by crossing, as I said, of two different uh, organisms of the same species or related species, uh, or because the modification, or, or they were improved by the use of mutagenesis. Uh, when you have crossing, you have the introduction of genes from different species and sometimes from species that don't have a history of uh, food use, uh, of course, cross with another one that has uh, such a history, but you can have new genes in, in, uh, inserted there. And when you have uh, breeds improved by mutagenesis, you have muta mutations that were introduced uh, either by one of those four options that are there, including chemical and radiological mutation. On the other side, on your right, you have genetically modified organisms or many times called transgenic organisms. These organisms uh, are, were improved by the insertion of a gene uh, that is artificial, human-made, and they it is foreign to the organisms before the technique. So in the case of new varieties, um, there is little, no usually there is little knowledge of what, what has been exactly modified. So the, the regulation uh, usually for, for those um, kinds of varieties uh, is usually based more on trait than in knowledge of the genome changes. In the case of genetically modified organisms, 
since the, the genetic modification was made uh, on purpose on a, on a very, for a very specific genetic change, the introduction of a new gene, uh, there is a full knowledge of the um, of what has been modified of, of what has been modified in the genome. Uh, but also there is a full characterization of the phenotype because the regulation requires to do so. In the, in the case again of new varieties, there is a registration procedure usually in, in most countries in, in the world. So you, when you have to register a new variety or, or a new breed, you have to um, describe its phenotype, how its phenotype is better or different from other varieties or breeds that are already in the market. When you do that, if the trait is very new or, be, or, or very innovative, sometimes the, um, the registering procedures will lead to a safety assessment process based on a very specific uh, risk hypothesis. Uh, but that happens very seldomly. So most of the time, new varieties have traits that are not so radically different. Uh, and every once in a while, a trait is very different uh, and it, think, uh, it makes um, authorities think this new trait could be dangerous. So we have a risk hypothesis and then only then you have a, a risk analysis process. Now in the terms of GMOs or genetically modified organisms, uh, regulations around the world in, in almost every country uh, with a few exceptions, they always require a risk analysis process. <clears throat> Uh, going back again to new varieties or breeds on your left, uh, if a re, um, risk assessment process uh, is enabled because of the novel trait, uh, then the, um, the evidence that the interested party or the developer has to gather and the cost of, the, of that part of the regulation is um, strictly proportional to the risk hypothesis because only the, the process is based on a very particular and, and single risk hypothesis. When it comes to GMO uh, or genetically modified organisms, there is already a fixed and shopping list of um, risk hypotheses. Uh, sometimes those risk hypotheses are not very relevant, <coughs> sorry, because of the because they are they don't have much to do with the trait of the GMO. But nevertheless in the regulation it is established that the developer must gather information uh, in regards to those possibilities and therefore that the regulatory pathway is uh, much more expensive and length. Now we're going to see an example of, uh, of these two kinds of uh, products. On, on now on the left you have a, an example of, of a new variety being developed by um, the exposure to radioactive substances. Of course the exposure to radioactive substances only occurs in the laboratory and the, the seeds that come out of that experiment are not radioactive. And of course, the descendants of that seeds doesn't have anything to do with uh, radiation. But in the past, radiation was used to damage the DNA randomly. We don't know exactly where, but uh, it created new traits. In this case, they could uh, select a trait for improving uh, cowpea to be drought tolerant. And now, the International Atomic Energy and the United Nations uh, Agency for Food and Agriculture are helping Zambia to adopt this uh, technology for the benefit of the farmers. Now on the right, <coughs> sorry, you have an example uh, where in a, in a different continent, Bolivia, uh, is uh, seriously considered adopting a genetically modified uh, soybean uh, that is also drought resistant, but in this case, that was obtained by using uh, or generating a GMO. This GMO was generated by an Argentine biotech company called BioCeres. So now, the, the idea here is we have, uh, before, before uh, genome editing uh, appeared, we had two uh, possible options. And then um, uh, scientists began using a new tool in molecular biology, which are site-directing nucleases. And site-directing nucleases, uh, the name means that these, um, these enzymes, these proteins, go to, the, to a specific place in the DNA that was selected by humans. And in that place of the DNA, they make a small um, damage. And from there, you have many possibilities. So uh, beginning from the left, 
if this site direct nuclease um, just damages the DNA and nothing else uh, is made by human intervention. The DNA repairs by its, the cell repairs the DNA without any help, and you can have a mutation. So usually, when we talk about genome editing, we talk about this simpler possibility. Then you have a slightly more complex possibility number two, where he, the human intervention helps the um, the cell to to repair the gene in a prede predetermined way. So the human also dictates exactly how it's going to be made the repair. And in that case, we, we also uh, are looking at a, a gene editing, but a, a, a slightly more uh, advanced way of doing gene editing. Then we have number three. In number three, uh, in addition to the use of the site directed nuclease, a whole new piece of DNA with a whole new gene is introduced into the cell. And therefore, you have an introduction of a foreign gene in a precise location in the genome. So now we are seeing again a genetically modified organism or a transgenic organism. The only difference is now, uh, instead of inserting this gene uh, randomly, it is inserted in a very specific location. But uh, for almost everyone, this is clearly a GMO. And then you have more complex possibility. Um, I, in this case, I didn't in, put a, um, a graph showing how the modification is made in the DNA because it's very complex. So I put a, a, I included a graph on how um, the technique works. Uh, it's known as gene drives. The gene drives are used for introducing a gene in a population and helping that gene to spread uh, faster than it usually, that it, what usually would happen. So in this case, some people uh, are describing this uh, latest uh, use of uh, cytoidetic nuclease as uh, a member of a wider group of new things called synthetic biology. So we can see here that we using cytoidetic nucleases, we can have a whole range of different kinds of products or outcomes, and um, the, they are being designated with different uh, denominations. But these are just genome editing, GMO, synthetic biology. So far, are only works. The thing is, uh, regulators need to decide uh, uh, what is the meaning of these words for legal and regulatory processes. So, um, in, for instance, in Argentina, we develop a, a very a very early we develop an approach in 2015. And our approach is based on the GMO definition for the Cartagena Protocol, which is the most uh, widely recognized international agreement for the biosafety of genetically modified organisms, or as it is called in the protocol, living modified organisms. And that definition says that this kind of products must have a novel combination of genetic material and the use of modern biotechnology. And this also, this uh, in the end means the use of recombinant DNA. So, in, in uh, on the base of this definition, we uh, made a, um, a decision tree. We we develop a decision tree in order to decide if a product uh, obtained by these techniques is a GMO or not. And we not uh, only develop a way of sorting between the two boxes, GM or GMO, but we also establish a way of minding the gap between the two regulatory options so they can uh, cross talk with each other uh, and help each other regardless of uh, the product being, uh, being established to be a GMO or a non-GMO. So we accumulated in, in four years. Actually, we have been discussing this uh, from 2012. We established the regulation in 2015, and uh, during four years, we have been uh, taking decisions on different uh, products. So we um, accumulated enough experience as to classify many products uh, from obtained with different techniques um, in this in in regards of those products being uh, GMOs or non-GMOs. Uh, since I have only talked about Argentina so far, this is a, a map I have, I have borrowed from a colleague to show you what is going around the world about this. And we have many countries in Latin America that are uh, having the same approach as Argentina nowadays. 
uh, in North America, Canada and the US have their own approaches based on a different rationale, but the outcome is very similar. And we have countries in, in Asia that are, that are also having their own uh, way of um, rationalizing this, uh, this decision or regulatory decisions about GMOs. And they, for most products, uh, their decisions are coincident with the ones of Latin American countries. And uh, we also have developments in countries like Russia, China, and in the European Union, it is rare because in there you have a struggle between different um, uh, outcomes. On one side, you have a legal outcome saying that all generated organisms are GMOs uh, because, in, because of a, a very special definition that they have in the European Union, which is not the definition of the Cartagena Protocol. But also in Europe, you have um, official advisory um, groups uh, or other legal authorities or national regulators that say that genome edited probes, at least the simpler kind of genome edited probes, are not GMO. So in Europe, they are still struggling around this. And in this map uh, of my colleague, uh, there is no, there is not, nothing painted in Africa, but actually in Africa, you have countries like Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, and others that are discussing about uh, this, um, how to regulate this, and they, are, they have quite advanced drafts or quite advanced discussions on the regulation. So surely in, in an updated version of this map, you will see them participating too. So I'm about to finish, and, and these are like a summary of, of the ideas I have tried to convey to you. So basically that most regulatory frameworks in any country in the world already have the tools for handle genome edited products because in most countries in the world, they are already uh, an established regulation for conventional varieties and GMOs. The only thing is to make a communication between them, to coordinate and to have a clarifying regulations for these new technologies. Uh, but it's important that all countries uh, try to, uh, to establish their um, regulations about genome editing in the same way, that they are harmonized. It can be done because we share a very uh, common base of uh, scientific knowledge. So in terms of regulatory expertise and knowledge about this technology, all the countries are in the same page, basically. But our main obstacle, as I mentioned for Europe, for instance, is that there are some countries that have their own definition of what is a GMO or what is a regulated biotechnology product. And therefore, uh, from those differences in the definitions, we have problems in sorting out um, specific products. In any case, there is a, um, an international uh, rule uh, in, included in international laws uh, that says that the, the regulatory burden for sanitary purposes can be as, as important or as much as justified to assure safety. But once you have a, the, the, the basic or minimal requirements to assure safety of a product, you shouldn't keep on building uh, an exaggerating burden of uh, regulation because that hinders the development of the country, the, the socioeconomic benefits derived from innovation. And also, because in here, we, it's important to take this other into account, in here we can have products with the same trait, uh, the same characteristics, the, the same benefits, the same hypothetical benefits uh, or hypothetical risk, but obtained with different technologies. But those technologies were applied very early in the lab and they are not present in the final product in the sense that uh, the radiation is not still in the plants or the genome edited plants are not being edited five generator, generations later and cannot edit any other organism that eats them. So therefore, uh, it's important that all of these technologies, even when the method to obtain them in the first place is different, are regulated very similarly if, they, if the end product is very similar. In here, there is a list of um, references that back my presentation. Um, or they were co-authored co by me. Uh, that doesn't mean that you have to read my papers. This is for, I, I just suggesting them as a first step, so you can get to the references and read other, other authors as well. And if you don't have time to, to copy this slide, just go to Google Scholar and Google my name and genome editing and you will find it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Uh, 
So we're going to move forward for the next poll. All types of gene editing techniques produce GMOs. Is it true or false? Okay, yes, correct. Not all types. Thank you very much. I think our audience is very knowledgeable. Let's move forward and I'm now going to introduce Dr. Nina Gloriani. She is currently the chair of the Philippines Vaccine Expert Panel and a retired professor of medical microbiology and immunology and the former dean of the College of Public Health, University of the Philippines, Manila. She was director of a senior tropical medicine Reg regional center and the director of the Institute of Biotechnology and Molecular Biology of the National Institute of Health. Dr. Gloriani conducted various basic and applied researches on hepatitis A, B, C, and B, HIV, herpes, and Hantan virus, and leptospirosis. Dr. Gloriani is a clinical microbiology consultant in the Institute of Pathology, St. Luke's Medical Center, Quezon City, and was the president of the Biotechnology Coalition of the Philippines for six years. She's a fellow of various medical and professional societies and continues to serve as the chairperson of the National Certification Committee for the Eradication of Poliomyelitis in the Philippines and a technical consultant to various agencies in the fields of medical microbiology, microbial immunology, and medical biotechnology. Let's have Dr. Gloriani on the floor, please. Oh, hello, everybody. I'm happy to share with you the health applications in genome editing. So this is the outline of my presentation, just uh, one slide for the beginnings and historical perspectives on genome editing for health, then two of the strategies for gene editing, then the main applications. I only have a few uh, examples on two hematologic diseases, on cancer, and there are many applications in viral infections, but I will focus on HIV. There are many other applications, cardiovascular and um, metabolic and neurodegenerative diseases that I will summarize. Well, I, I, I know Dr. Lema already presented the genome editing uh, basics, but I just want maybe to emphasize as a microbiologist that all of these enzymes came from bacteria. So from uh, E. coli, from Streptococcus pyogenes, and they are used by this uh, bacteria to attack or destroy viruses. So it's like their way of um, dealing with invaders. So after well, all of these uh, basics have been uh, discussed, just to say that genome editing may be done in vitro or what we call ex vivo or in vivo when you directly insert into the host any of these targeted genes or any ablation, correction, and other genomic modification. So this is the in vivo strategy for CRISPR. Well, I, I, I just use CRISPR, Cas9-based gene therapy, because it's, it is the one that is uh, most uh, used in the health uh, application. So by in vivo editing, we mean that the CRISPR, Cas9 components are directly delivered into the patient for in situ, so meaning there in that space and time, gene editing, they may use viruses to deliver the genes or non-viral vectors, which could be naked DNA, DNA encapsulating liposomes, compacted DNA, DNA na nanoparticles, and other cell-penetrating peptides. So it is a direct injection into the host. In this case, human, we're talking about human, maybe injected into animals as well. The ex vivo strategy actually does the modification outside of the, the host, in this case, the human host. So on the left side, you will see cell culture based ex vivo editing. So these are adult uh, somatic cells that will have to be taken from the host and then in the laboratory, in vitro, they have, will have to be modified. So you see there, the cells will be expanded, clonally selected, and the correction will be made by the CRISPR-Cas9 enzyme system. On the other side, we have, it is possible to also change or modify pluripotential stem cells. I think this is the way to go for many of 
these health applications because you deal with the youngest uh, uh, cells of the hematopoietic system, for instance. Now, for the examples, I think gene therapy for hematologic diseases have been with us for more than five decades already. But this CRISPR technology has introduced more precise modifications. And as an example, we have, for instance, beta thalassemia. This is a blood-related genetic disorder which involves the absence of, entire absence of, or usually just errors in genes responsible for the production of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a, a protein in present in the red blood cells, which we use for oxygenation of our cells. So this is done ex vivo. The gene editing is done outside the body. And uh, from uh, the, the recent uh, reports, CRISPR therapeutics has edited more than 80% of human hematopoietic stem cells using, uh, well, their, their system. To, pro to produce red blood cells with high levels of fetal hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin compared to adult hemoglobin can bind oxygen much better than adult form of hemoglobin. This is then transfused back to the patient. So from beta thalassemia, well, hemophilia is, uh, pro is, is really not very rare. Actually, there we have cases of both hemophilia A and hemophilia B. As an example, I have here hemophilia B which is an X-linked recessive monogenic disorder, meaning there is one gene that is involved. It only affects, it affects one in 25,000 males. And uh, these people with hemophilia B have mutations in the factor nine uh, coagulation component. So we have many blood clotting factors. So the, for hemophilia B, it's factor nine. These mutations, will lead to spontaneous bleeding. So these patients or these people are not able to have their blood clotting. So in the past, current, or actually up to now, the current clinical treatment of hemophilia B consists of life, lifelong therapy with injections of factor eight. So every time they will have to go to that um, injection. But with uh, this gene therapy, we have CRISPR-Cas9 targeted integration of uh, factor nine gene using an adenovirus vector delivery. So much of what we can see or have been reported have been done in uh, uh, mice, but we hope to see some of this in the future in humans, as I said in humans. Now with cancer, I think this is where more people will be more uh, aware or will be more uh, interested. Now, there are three things I will have to share with you here. First is the concept of oncogenes. Cancer is generated by oncogenes. Actually, every person has what we call proto-oncogenes. These are not bad genes, but they can become bad, and we call them oncogenes. So oncogenes are bad genes that are permanently turned on or activated. So they're always on. So they produce, uh, they, they, uh, this, this, permanent uh, activation allows them to grow out of control and lead to cancer. You know that if your cells continue on dividing, then you, that may lead to cancer. And some of these bad genes are due to mutations that activate these oncogenes by chromosome rearrangement, by gene duplication, or having extra copies of a gene, making too much of a certain protein that will make the cells grow and grow unlimited. Uh, so the CRISPR system, what can it do? It can turn genes involved in cancer on and off. So for instance, this, uh, this our photo here, image here shows that CRISPR could potentially treat cancer by generating mutations through turning off the oncogenes. Actually, the, the same picture where they're both left or right uh, show that the CRISPR system, the different enzyme nucleases, can turn off these oncogenes. And the ultimate goal is to remove malignant mutations and replace them with normal DNA sequences. So that is turning off. Now, we want something that the CRISPR will turn on. So also, the no, any normal person will have tumor suppressor genes if we are normal. And one of the examples of tumor suppressor genes is P53. 
these uh, genes will keep cells from dividing too quickly or slow down cell division and repair DNA mistakes. So there are family cancer syndromes where we showed or where that have uh, been reported to show inherited abnormalities of tumor suppressor genes. So they have these mutations in their P53 gene that will allow cells to proliferate, cells to migrate, cells to invade, and cells to survive much longer than they should be surviving. So all that on the right side here, they're involved in cancer metabolism and in resisting chemotherapy. So CRISPR is able to turn on suppressor gene. So from the red, which is uh, mutated P53, CRISPR could be used to turn on the suppressor gene and allow the patient to suppress the tumor or cancer. So the green one, we want the green one. And well, those are turning on and off the genes, but we have another uh, platform here, and this is actually being used in personalized medicine for cancer patients. This is what we call the CAR T cell therapy. CAR T cell therapy uses specially altered T cells. T cells are a part of our immune system in order to fight cancer, but T cells can also be used to fight other infections. So a patient's T cells are collected from the blood, then modified to produce special structures that we call chimeric antigen receptors. So they are a hybrid chimera on their surface. We may also call them CRISPR T cells. Now these T cells are genetically modified to have cancer recognizing receptors which make them very efficient killer T cells, killing tumor cells. So this is currently an emerging uh, field of immunotherapy for us in, uh, or in, in cancer or in oncology. So it, sometimes they use the term supercharging the patient's own immune system. So making the immune system of the, the whole really charged up to fight cancer through genetic CRISPR was used to turn off PD gene, which is used by tumors to dampen immune responses against the tumor. Crippled genes, then the second is the crippled genes coding for the CRISPR would cripple genes coding for the natural T cell receptor. So you create a blank T cell, a T cell that will not recognize other antigens. And after that, creating that blank T cell, uh, they will insert a designer receptor that will arm the T cell with cancer homing property. So this is the property that will make that T cell know which tumor antigen to bind to and which tumor to uh, kill or to um, attack. So that is a very, very promising therapy and actually there are many reports of that already on human trials. So, hematologic disorders and we have um, cancer and just one of the viral infections because I worked with HIV before. So you know that HIV attacks or enters host cells, specifically those that are CD4 positive, like T cells, using certain receptors. Here we look at CXCR4 and CCR5. These are co-receptors for human immunodeficiency virus. So if that uh, entry of the virus is successful, what will happen towards the, after several stages of the viral replication, that the T cell will die. Now, how do we, how did they uh, try to solve this using, of course, CRISPR? So they have identified, uh, they use gene editing enzymes that have been prepackaged into adenovirus or a lentivirus. These enzymes could knock off or ablate or delete the CXCR4 and CCR5 genes. Of course, that they do that uh, separately. So what you come up with is a letter C here, CCR5 and CXCR4 being deleted from T cell. So that T cell can no longer be invaded or uh, attacked by the virus. So th this has made the T cells in these patients resistant to further HIV entry and invasion. Um, the, the next slide will actually just show how this um, 
CCR 5 gene editing has progressed over the years. So it started back in 1996 when they found that uh, actually a certain person uh, was found to have a 32 base pair deletion of the CCR5 receptor. And this person with that deletion was found to be resistant to HIV. And that is the one that gave them the idea to that it is possible to edit this receptor. And over the years, now in, in 2009 up to I think more recent ones, with clinical trials for this particular edited version of CCR5 or CCR4 of, in, of T cells of uh, patients with HIV has been ongoing. Okay, so this is actually my last slide. So those only a few examples here, but we know that these health applications are increasing, but take note that most of these are largely personalized med medical intervention for usually rare, complex, or challenging diseases like genetic diseases, mutation driven malignancies, and viruses. Actually, the, uh, aside from HIV, we have human papilloma virus, hepatitis B virus, and EBV. These last three viruses are actually oncogenic viruses, meaning they can also cause cancer. So a lot of CRISPR is ongoing also for their therapy. Now remember also that for, for humans, at least, the somatic cells and not the embryo cells are modified because we do have a lot of ethical issues. There has to be regulatory oversight. Of course, we're looking at cost and equity. Should uh, these um, technologies be available to patients? We always look for safety, quality, and efficacy. We, what we remember that we need more improvements in technology so that we reduce off targets. You, you, do not, you do not want to modify DNA unnecessarily. So you reduce off targets, and, uh, and at the same time, you increase efficiency in just targeting what you need to target. Now, just to say a few things more, I think uh, microbes here uh, may be bad for us, but they help us in many ways because through their enzyme systems, we are able to do all of these genetic modifications for the sake of our patients. So thank you very much, that's all. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gloriani. Those, is, those are very comprehensive slides and the first time that I saw that really genome editing can work on for our healthcare. Now we move forward and let's see the third, I think it's the third uh, poll now. Okay, all gene edited products must be regulated as GMOs, true or false? It should be false. Okay, now uh, we're moving forward. Uh, I am looking at the many questions that come in for Dr. Lema and for Dr. Gloriani. Please let them come in. Let's move and look at uh, the next speaker. Let's listen to the next speaker. Dr. Marcus Weiss is the strain director in Global Regulatory Affairs and Quality Management of DSM based in Switzerland. Royal DSM is a global purpose-led science-based company active in nutrition, health, and sustainable living. He holds, uh, Dr. Weiss holds a PhD in cell biology and postdoc in the medical fields. Dr. Weiss worked in the chemical and biotechnology industry first with F. Hoffman LaRoche and since 2003 was employed at DSM. He has held various managerial positions in R&D, technical product management, human resources, project, and program management. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Weiss. Many thanks, uh, Margaret and Rodora, for giving me the opportunity to present uh, in this webinar, and hello to everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to outline what impact uh, genome editing has in industrial biotechnology. Let me start with a short introduction into our company. DSM is more than 100 years old and has started actually in coal mining. Over the decades, it has gone through many transformations. From coal mining, it went into fertilizers and petrochemistry, and from there into nutrition, health, and sustainable living. Out of our sales of roughly 10 billion annually, two thirds go into animal 
and human nutrition and health, and roughly one third goes into high performance plastics. In the nutrition field, DSM is the number one supplier of vitamins, nutritional lipids, such as omega-3 fatty acids, carotenoids, and other nutraceuticals. So products uh, which can increase the nutritional profile of foods and feed. And often these products are sold as premixed custom nutrient premixes. For our ingredients, we use either chemical synthesis, extraction from biological materials, or biotechnology. The choice of the production method is often dictated by what is most economical, but also ecological. Those two aspects in industrial biotechnology are very closely linked. As you can see on the slide, sustainability is a core value of our company. We believe that technologies are not the solution, are not the cure for all the problems we have on our planet. But to solve those challenges that the world is facing without, without technologies is also not an option. In our view, genome editing has an important role to play. We've uh, looked at the history on this slide. Let's also look at the history of genetic engineering, both from a technology perspective, but also from a regulatory perspective. 1973 marks the year of the first DNA cloning. And those who have lived the 1980s, they will remember the big impact that a single technology such as PCR can have to bring an entire field forward. And obviously the same happens again now with the genome editing techniques. At the same time, obviously there have been huge advances in DNA sequencing from the first generation, generation sequencing techniques that were also used to establish the human genome project to the second generation techniques which emerged as of 2004. Nowadays, it is possible quickly and at relatively low cost to easily uh, sequence the entire genome of at least microorganisms. And this in turn, in turn allows to check that the genetic modifications we do with whatever technology they happen as planned, that no unintended side effects are happening or if such side effects are happening, what they are and whether they have any impact on the safety of a microorganism. How does this now relate to the regulatory developments? In the 1970s, uh, the DNA cloning caused a lot of concerns among scientists, and that's why the scientific community convened in 1975 uh, in the famous Asilomar conference in the United States to define how to approach DNA cloning. They decided on a moratorium until a proper safety framework is in place. Shortly thereafter, the first NIH guidelines were published in the US, followed in 1806 by the Blue Book of the OECD. Still, in the logical sequence of the concerns uh, of the early days, the first versions of the EU directives on GMOs were uh, entering into force in 1990, and the same mentality also dictated the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety under the roof of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Why do I mention that, and why is it so important to emphasize it? While science and technology have continued to evolve and to make rapid progress, the regulatory framework is still grounded on the scientific knowledge and concerns of the early days and has not taken it into account adequately the scientific progress that has happened since then. Now let's move 
to industrial biotechnology. In industrial biotechnology, we use a relatively limited number of major workhorses to produce fermentatively uh, a large number of products. Filamentous fungi, such as Aspergillus nitri, yeasts, such as Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or bacteria, such as Bacillus subtilis or Escherichia coli. As mentioned, a large variety of product classes can be produced fermentatively. And in many cases, genetic engineering has been used to improve either the process efficiency or to strengthen the safety of the production microorganism. Increases in process efficiency obviously typically result in higher product quality, in better economics, and in a better eco footprint. So higher sustainability of fermentative production. Some product classes, however, particularly life uh, microorganisms, uh, they are still typical non-GM uh, classes, not because there is not potential to improve also those microorganisms, but simply because of the public uh, pushback on GMOs. As already presented in the previous uh, talks, genome editing obviously is much more efficient, more precise, more targeted than traditional GM techniques. And as a result of that, in industrial biotechnology, use of genome editing is already now widely used and is the norm rather than the exception. I would even go a step further and boldly state that all products currently on the market derived from GMMs would now be developed using genome editing techniques, simply because it's much more straightforward. There are two important caveats though. Still, not all the microorganisms are equally amenable to genome editing. So there is still technological development needed. And secondly, even if the technology is there, companies may still not use genome editing at this stage because of the complex patent landscape and the associated legal uncertainties. Let's return to regulations. And we've heard already this distinction between GMOs versus non-GMOs. Uh, although obviously the real world is not such binary to have only this distinction, the real world is much more gradual. As we've heard, the new genome editing techniques, they question the separation between GMOs and non-GMOs simply because you can use them to introduce a single base substitution, which would be very much on this side. But you can also use these techniques to introduce entire heterologous genes, which according to the old definitions would be GMOs. Even worse, the EU Court of Justice has ruled in 2018 that plants and microorganisms obtained by genome editing, the newer techniques are to be considered GMOs, which obviously has the uh, result that products with the very same genetic changes and the very same properties are, different, are regulated differently simply because different techniques have been used to generate them. And then as said before, for products that are still uh, typically non-GM, obviously this uh, ruling represents a strong disincentive against using genome editing for the improvement of such products be it dairy cultures, probiotics, bread, wine, or beer yeasts, just as examples. In the interest of time, I will not go into detail on what these additional opportunities might be. I just refer to this article of Barangu and Notebart, um, 
which have highlighted that if society endorsed genome editing and would not link it to this uh, stigmatizing GMO, non-GMO uh, definitions or di uh, dichotomy, there would be a lot of additional opportunities for genome editing all along the food chain, making food safer, making food production more efficient, more sustainable. What does this, that all tell us? As said, first of all, genome editing is there. It is the rule rather than the exception in industrial biotechnology. As also outlined in the previous presentations, what truly counts are the benefits and properties of products, not how they are produced. The process-centric perspectives of the Cartagena protocol and of many GMO regulatory frameworks, they are no longer fit for purpose. And now is the time to act, to redefine our approach to biotechnology so that innovative solutions can be used in the best interest of society and the environment. That there is hope. Uh, I have brought up a few recent examples. Uh, on one hand, the former EU commissioner on health and food safety, but also the German Minister of Food, Agriculture and Consumer Protection, which advocated for genome editing and that it should not receive the same destiny as GMOs in the past. Even more remarkably, the German uh, uh, fraction uh, group of uh, uh, representatives of the German Green Party, Germany traditionally more against the GMOs, they have uh, nine days ago published a fantastic pamphlet in, uh, uh, for the uh, benefit, for the use, the responsible use of uh, genetic engineering overall, obviously including genome editing. And what remains is obviously that uh, I count on all of us in this webinar that uh, we also serve as ambassadors to bring those uh, messages forward and hopefully to change the approach to biotechnology that we had over the last 30, 40 years. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Wise. Uh, we have, uh, we're still waiting for a lot more questions, but while we do that, we can also put up our uh, fourth poll, please. Okay, gene editing is more affordable than genetic modification. Okay, true or false? Thank you very much. Let's see the response. True, definitely true. Thank you very much, audience. Now we're moving forward to the question and answers. Can we have the gallery, please? Okay, so that we can have all our speakers on board. Um, we're now going to, I have uh, seen here some very interesting questions that uh, every one of us will appreciate truly. So the first question would be from um, an anonymous attendee. Is, in your opinion, is synthetic biology different from synthetic genomics? Uh, anybody can answer. Uh, unmute your microphones, please. Maybe Dr. Lima. Is synthetic biology different from synthetic of genomics or is it the same? Sorry. Uh, there. This is the, the first time I, I hear the, the term synthetic <laughs> genomics. People, yeah, people is, is making up new terms okay. uh, all of the time. Um, the, the this is not uh, random. People usually coin new terms because uh, you really have an innovation sometimes, but sometimes it's because they want things to be treated differently, differently by society, regulated differently or perceived differently. So uh, for, for me, in order to answer that, I, I should read a little bit more about the use of this synthetic genomic uh, term. Uh, 
uh, but okay. nowadays, in 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 the in regards to regulation, uh, you you can make as many terms as you like. For instance, with GMO, people coin the term uh, cisgenic instead of transgenic for certain applications, trying to have the those applications treated differently. But in the end, what what is important? The only thing important is the definition of the of a regulated article in your national law. You can make up as many technical terms uh, as you want, but in the end, the only important thing will be the legal definition. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Lema. There's another question for you here, so we'll just uh, ask two questions for you, and then there are the others. How is the global? Uh, this is from Bambang Porwantara from uh, our Indonesian Biotech Information Center. How is the global trend to regulate either genome editing or synthetic biology? Will they be categorized as GMO with very strict regulatory processes? How active is the National Biosafety Commission in Argentina to try to prepare this new technology accommodated into proper regulation? Well, in, 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 as I have described, we worked uh, eight years far. Uh, we were one of the first uh, national commissions in Biosafety to work on the issue. And uh, at least in regards to the rationale to regulate the products, uh, we have things quite uh, developed right now. Uh, so, so nowadays we are focusing on helping other countries on, on reaching the same status. In regards to the, what will be the global situation in the future, I cannot uh, promise anything or, or be sure about anything, but the trend is quite good. At least when we began in 2015, we were one of the few countries in the world having a policy for this and now only four years later uh, many countries have policies that are very similar to the ones by Argentina so I'm quite positive about the future. Very good thank you very much Dr. Lema. Uh, there, we have a question for Dr. Nina Gloriani maybe you know this where does this is from Ryan Bedford of USDA Pass Manila what, where does the Philippines currently stand on genome editing regulations? Are they close to having a regulatory framework? Well, I, I'm, I'm really sorry I cannot answer that, but uh, as far as I know we are trying to address that issue from different uh, agencies here. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure there will be considerations for those well, if you're just talking about health, we have very mm -hmm. stringent requirements for health products. But for other biotechnologies, I think the government is looking at that. All the interagency. Sorry, I cannot. <laughs> okay, thank you. And then here's another one uh, from Kenya, Archelius Anami. Uh, just an inquiry. If we knock out CXCR4, and CCR5 for HIV treatments, won't there be issues in future? In the future, these receptors aren't useful in the first place, and will this be a treatment for both HIV1 and 2 types? Um, I think we do not knock this out for all people. It's being knocked out for people who are infected with HIV. So as you know, HIV attacks mainly T cells. Of course, there are other cells like macrophages. So this is not to knock out everything because they, these um, uh, receptors we have some uh, use for other things. So it's not just for HIV. So we cannot knock out everybody's receptors for that. I don't think it's coming. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this would be a question for uh, Dr. Marcos Weiss. Uh, from Jomerson Tolentino, what would be the effect now on our socioeconomic and also in our environment? Is there a huge production of genetically modified organisms and products and genome edited products that can affect our socioeconomic conditions and the environment? Um, in the pipeline, perhaps, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. It all depends whether we make this distinction of what we release into the environment versus what we keep in fermenters and then uh, properly dispose of uh, at the end uh, of fermentation. Uh, and also, obviously, it's a question what we call genetically modified because genetic modification is something inherent to nature that happens anyway. And uh, we 
in my opinion, uh, we overstate what human beings do in terms of the amount of genetic changes that we introduce and how different this is to what also naturally uh, happens. But that's my personal opinion. So in that sense, the, the question is difficult to answer because a genome edited um, plant or a genome edited microorganism could also happen in nature. Such single mutations, uh, they are happening uh, naturally and are there in much higher numbers than uh, we can reasonably produce in industry. So again, it's, uh, it's not really helpful to look at the technologies and classify according to technologies, but really looking mm -hmm. at uh, what are the boundaries we have in our uh, on our planet, on our uh, society, the number of people we need to feed, and what solutions do we need to have to serve uh, all the uh, climate and biodiversity ambitions in the best way. And uh, as I said, uh, we strongly believe technology must play a role in those uh, solutions. Yeah, that's a good answer. Uh uh, this question is, I think you can answer all this because what is bothering people is missing the target during genome editing. Are there any mitigations or uh, measures to correct all the missing targets or make it accurate somehow during ge genome editing? Well, yes, uh, I, I again start with uh, the uh, what is not considered uh, genetic engineering. Typically, classical mutagenesis, uh, as also addressed by Martin, um, is uh, introducing many more changes that we do actually not know for. This is accelerated uh, mutation. Um, and so there, nobody cares about all those uh, unintended effects. The beauty of genome editing is the much higher precision that you know uh, what you are doing. Uh, and that it happens at much higher precision. And what I said is that we should not only look at the technique of genetic engineering, but also on the analytical side, what we can uh, nowadays do. And we can mm -hmm. do for microorganisms already whole genome sequencing. So we can absolutely at the base level check what has happened in addition to the intended change mm -hmm. and then decide is that really of concern or not. But due to the higher precision of the technologies anyway, there's uh, much less of those uh, unintended side effects to start with. And yeah. uh, technology develops so quickly, this will also become the, the standard in, uh, in, in higher eukaryotes uh, over time. I'm convinced. Right. That's correct. Uh, do you have any additions, Dr. Gloriani or Dr. Lema, no. on the uh, targeting? Some uh, leaky stuff during genome editing? How do we met mitigate it? No, well, yeah. uh, Dr. My, uh, Weiss has already responded very well. Now, there's one question here. Some of the people nowadays think that the GMO gene editing gene modification has a negative effect on our body system, immune system, the rise of new diseases, or effects on the environment. How can we make? How can we make, be made assured? How can we be assured? that the new organism has no bad effects once it will be introduced to us or to the environment. <laughs> or, <laughs> so I mean, biggest risk assessment. And, yeah. Mm, maybe I should. Oh, to try. go ahead. No, go ahead. Dr. Lemon, Dr. Lema, Dr. Is Lariani, the... go, you go first. Ah, okay. Uh, remember that when we're do doing gene editing for said some of these genetic disorders, it is very precise. It is done for a specific person. They're looking at mutations mm. in these uh, patients and then correcting those mutations. So I don't see anybody who is not being treated getting that uh, same product or whatever. So, so there, there is even no, uh, what's this, environmental contamination or other concerns here. As I said, it is a very personalized thing. So it, for the immune responses, we are actually looking at how to strengthen the immune response in this patient. So, but of course, all of these are being done in animals first, using model animals, and before we even move on to humans. The human trials have been there for many years, and uh, it's, it's just the very stringent requirements for safety and efficacy that we're following. That's why they're not out there in the market 
to cater to everybody. Okay, thank you very much. Do you have any addition, Dr. Lemma? Yeah, I, I was about to say in, re, in regards to this question about how can we assure that the products are safe? That's a, that's a valid question. It not necessarily have, has to be focused on the technology used to obtain the product because we have examples of new plant uh, varieties or, that uh, were uh, obtained by spontaneous mutation. I mean, there was not even human intervention. The, the DNA just broke and repaired by itself in a different way with a different sequence. So a new trait was obtained and that new trait was uh, useful for agriculture, uh, but then it was harmful. For instance, there was a mutant uh, celery plant, uh, a spontaneous mutant, no human interventions to obtain that mutation. And that celery was, mutant celery was selected because it has, it had better um, response to pest. It was pest resistant. Uh, but nevertheless, the same thing that plant pest resist had been uh, harmful to humans. So the plant was uh, inadvertently introduced in the market and only afterwards people realized that uh, it was harmful to a human. Uh, and there was a spontaneous mutation, a very traditional breeding process. So um, the risks are more related with the final characteristics of the products and not with the technology that was used to obtain them. So it's a valid question uh, to, from, from, public, from, from the general public to say how regulators can do their work better in terms of not allowing harmful products to be in the market but that um, shall be more broadly based on the characteristics of the product and not the technology used to obtain them. Because uh, you may be misleading the regulators if you, if you impose the regulators with very artificial definitions on what can be regulated that are based in the product, you are forcing the regulators to pay a lot of attention on certain products and not to see others with the same uh, level of uh, scrutiny. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Lemo. I, I we're going to, I'm gonna raise the last question and this is for Dr. Marcus Weiss. This is from John Albert Caran. How viable do you think the use of genome editing will be on microalgae? Do you have initiatives for microalgae-based biofuel or other important pharmaceuticals or vaccine production, for example? Well, those are for, <laughs> for uh, Nina and Dr. Weiss. Well, for microalgae, uh, definitely, I think that uh, can help uh, to improve uh, productivity further. Uh, I think with biofuels, we still have uh, issues uh, to make them really economical. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I do not have concrete examples for that. Okay. And for Dr. Yumina, do you have uh, genome editing for microalgae used for pharmaceuticals for perhaps? None that I am uh, aware of, <laughs> sorry. Okay, <laughs> no, I am not but I'm familiar. Yeah, let's pause a while to see the last poll and then we will listen to a two minute closing or messages from our speakers. Let's see the poll first. The fifth poll question. Okay, the risks of gene edited products are higher than GMOs, which are higher than which are higher than conventional breeding techniques. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see the response. I think our audience are very uh, knowledgeable already on this topic. They're all getting the correct answer. Okay, that's right. So it's a false. Thank you very much. So at this point, we would like to give uh, a chance uh, for our speakers to give their uh, two minute take home messages other than the ones that you have presented, or you would like to emphasize a little bit more on your take home messages. Thank you. We start with Dr. Lima. Well, um, thank you. I, I have repeated myself many times uh, du during the seminar. So I would okay. like to <laughs> talk a little bit about uh, uh, something different, something new, uh, uh, which is uh, the off-target effects. I think one of the questions that you said uh, was responding a, in a way, but perhaps the, um, the first the interested person was uh, have, have a question about off-target effects. 
And in, in regards to that, uh, it's important because the public hears about genome editing and off targets effects that we um, describe that these technologies are being improved to avoid having uh, any addition outside of the target region. Uh, there are, some of these techniques are very effective in doing that. And of course, you have a very different world when it comes to health application versus uh, agriculture or uh, industrial application. Because when, when you have agricultural or industrial applications, you do genome editing on a plant or a microorganisms. You hope to obtain exactly the addition that you wanted to do. But then you screen different uh, organisms, the different uh, individuals, and you, say, and you can make a whole genome determination, for instance, and select those that have the addition that you want and no other addition, and then uh, take that to the regulatory offices and ultimately to the market. So um, the techniques are very precise. And also there is a, a process where you can discard the plants or the microorganisms that they didn't re resolve the way you wanted to. In regards to health uh, applications, uh, you only can apply the, the process once to the patient or something like that. So you don't have much, uh, as well as in agricultural applications in animals, where it's not desirable to have uh, off-target effects, even at the, even at the start, because you don't want to discard uh, the animals that were not edited exactly as you wanted. So when it comes to human and animal applications, uh, there is a lot of energy uh, and a lot of efforts being uh, put on having no off-target uh, effects in, of this technology. Thank you, Dr. Lama. Let's hear now from Dr. Gloriani. Um, okay, yes. Well, I, I just want to, the, the, the key message really for health applications at this is that these, these are all for the more, the rarer conditions the intractable conditions, the chronic conditions for which we have no conventional treatment. So that is where all of this gene editing will apply, not, not to, to everybody who has an illness. Now, one thing I, I mm. failed to actually include because it is not actually gene editing, but just gene detecting, is how we are using CRISPR technology now for COVID-19 diagnostics. And in the U.S. alone, there are two companies, one in Cambridge and one in uh, California, that are testing the, their uh, platforms to, to have COVID-19 tested in, one, in thousands of people in a short period of time. So this CRISPR technology allows them to put in you know, all these variations of the, the variants, the genetic variants of these uh, viruses, and have the results in a few hours. So, so that is not really entirely gene editing, but that is gene detecting. But I, I'm sure that later on some gene editing will come in because of the variants of these viruses that we are now seeing. So that is all. Thank you very much, Dr. Doriani. That's very good. Now we go for uh, Dr. Weiss. Yeah, I, I risk to repeat myself, but uh, after 25 years of industrial biotech, uh, I'm really enthusiastic that now is the time to move away from these outdated uh, uh, process-centric regulatory frameworks and uh, to move towards a product-centric perspective where the properties of a product uh, are in the center of attention. Techniques are never the solution uh, to our problems alone. Uh, and uh, a single technique cannot uh, solve all the problems. But... Uh, Making responsible use uh, of technology is for me crucial, and in that uh, in that respect, um, I feel thrilled uh, after this webinar. Uh, uh, appreciate it a lot, uh, and look forward to that uh, we can go that path further. Thank you very much. Uh, if we're in live audience, we'll give you a big round of applause. Very very well. Okay, thank you. And now we are going to introduce to you the, uh, Dr. Margaret Corambu, who's going to give us the closing message. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, from the entire ISA family, it has been such a great honor hosting you. Such a diverse and accomplished community of practitioners from the whole results, we are definitely having a very uh, uh, accomplished uh, set of practitioners. We are deeply humbled by your presence, your participation, and just giving us your precious time to share a dose of knowledge on genome editing together. I know for some of us it's late, 
that we have stayed on until now. Well, as experience has taught us, experience has taught us that, uh, you know, the worst experience teaches us the best lesson. In other words, experience is the best teacher, but we also know that the worst experience teach the best lesson. Sharing knowledge on crop biotechnology over the last 22 years from, the, from a nicer perspective has taught us that you cannot talk about applications of cutting edge technologies in agriculture alone without carrying along health, environment, and industrial applications. And we are starting early to bring this on board through these webinars to ensure that when genome editing is up and running, as we have seen, then we'll be talking about the benefits that it is uh, accruing in agriculture, in health, and in environment. So we want to pull together through uh, addressing these global challenges together in a very inclusive version. So in our next webinar series, we'll continue looking at how these applications are running across the three main sectors, health, agriculture and environment, but most importantly, we'd also like to look at how best to communicate the same, uh, the same uh, processes so that our regulatory systems can become easier. And as Marcos uh, frustratingly keeps repeating that uh, we hope we are not going to continue going round and round, we need regulations, but we need these regulations that can support innovations and the applications in all these fields. So keep watching, keep with us as we unveil the new ISA. Our next webinar series will be in two weeks time. Uh, we'll keep you informed about uh, the topic of discussion and we'll also reach you out for more on this and others. So please keep up the discussion, keep it lively. Let us continue with those interactions, be part of our network. Thank you, thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Karambu. And uh, at this point, you would like to thank our speakers for giving us this time to share your knowledge to everybody, to the global community. We have more than 300 participants. And uh, some of the questions were very interesting, but with the limited time, we cannot trace all of them. So they will be provided to you. And then we will be uh, putting together the transcripts of all those answers to those questions. We would like to thank our panelist, Dr. Arujayan, who has been uh, answering also some of the questions in the chat group, and also the staff of the Southeast Asia and Afri Center of AISA. Now we'd like to, for you, we're going to invite you to please subscribe to all our uh, materials. So I'm gonna, EJ is going to put up the there you go. We have the drum beat. We have uh, the crop biotech update and the petri dish. And you can subscribe by uh, logging on to them your email address. And of course, if you want us to continue this uh, very wonderful webinar, you can go to the ISA.org or donate if you want to donate. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, people. And uh, let's see each other again during the next webinar. Good night, everybody.